My name is David Keller. Over the last two lectures, we defined ethics as a philosophical study of morality using the tools of rationality. In this episode, I'd like to take a closer look at ethical theory itself in the Western intellectual tradition before we move on and look at some of the theories by actual philosophers. Now, to understand ethics in the Western intellectual tradition, we need to distinguish between normative ethics and meta-ethics. Normative ethics are what philosophers refer to as the actual ethical theories themselves, where meta-ethics is uh, the study of uh, theories about the ethical theories. Now, this sounds rather nebulous and convoluted, but it is really not. Again, normative ethics are the actual ethical theories themselves, and meta-ethics are questions about those theories. We can understand this distinction easily if we draw an analogy with religion. We all know that around the world, there are specific religions practiced by specific groups of people. We have a wide variety of animistic religions throughout the world. We have uh, Zoroastrianism from Persia. We have uh, Jainism and Hinduism from India. We have Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, and a wide variety of other religions. All, the, all of these religions are specific religions with doctrine and structures of authoritative leadership and so on and so forth. Um, we can ask questions about these specific religions, um, how people practice them in their daily lives, um, what scriptures they live by, um, what religious authorities they defer to, so on and so forth. These actual religions would be equivalent in, in philosophy to normative ethics, the actual ethical theories themselves, the actual religions themselves. Now, in religion, aside from asking questions about specific religions, and the doctrines of those religions and the power structures of those religions, we can ask general questions about religion itself, such as, can there only be one true religion, or is it possible that there can be more than one true religion? Here we have a meta-religious question. We're not asking a question about how Zoroastrians or Jains or Buddhists or Jews practice their religion in their everyday lives. We are asking a general, sweeping, universal question about religion itself. So this would be a meta-religious question. Again, this is similar to ethics and meta-ethics. We can ask questions about specific ethical theories but we can ask, also ask questions about those theories in general. The paramount meta-ethical question is, are there universal objective standards by which people should live their lives which transcend culture, which transcend the peculiarities of, of place and time, or are, are normative standards, our moral standards rooted in culture and different for different persons in different places at different times? The distinction between specific religions and meta-religious questions parallels the distinction in philosophy between normative ethics and meta-ethics. We can ask questions about the particular ethical theories themselves, but we can ask general questions about uh, all ethical theories. The paramount meta-ethical question in philosophy is, are there objective moral standards 
which transcend culture, which transcend all people in all places at all times, or on the other hand, are moral standards embedded in culture and are they different for different peoples in different places at different times? This is the medical, this is the meta-ethical question of objectivism versus realism. Objectivism, uh, medical, uh, me meta-ethical objectivism holds that there are one and only one correct answer about how people should act and that answer is never contingent upon the specifics of place or time or culture. In other words, for the meta-ethical objectivist, moral standards are never relative to culture but transcend culture and are the same for all people at all places at all times. The meta-ethical meta relativist, on the other hand, holds that moral standards change from culture to culture, from place to place, from time to time, and they, they vary. And there are no objective standards, morally speaking. You have heard the phrase, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. This reflects the uh, this reflects meta-ethical relativism. Now, in American culture, meta-ethics, the meta-ethical question between objectivism on one hand and relativism on the other is a tough question for us. We're, we're a, a pluralistic culture proud of our multiculturalism. We are proud to be a melting pot of many different cultural influences from around the world. And, and uh, so on, 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 on that level, we attempt to be tolerant of different cultures and different uh, moral practices. On the other hand, Americans are very judgmental when it comes to political regimes which we deem to be totalitarian and despotic. And so on one hand, we uh, take pride in tolerance, but on the other hand, we also um, take pride in being judgmental and upholding what we consider to be objective moral standards. The tension between relativism and objectivism, um, it, it, we, we experience in our everyday lives, especially when we meet people from different cultures, uh, um, as we march through uh, our daily lives. Consider the following example. Let's say that you live in Queens and down the hall in your apartment building is a family from Sudan. The parents have immigrated from Sudan and are very eager to um, raise their children and assimilate their children into American culture. But on the other hand, like all immigrant parents, are eager to retain some of the, the, the cultural heritage that they have brought with them from Sudan. And uh, you've taken up the practice of having afternoon tea with, uh, with the mother of the family. And one day over tea, you, uh, you begin talking about something that you learned about in college, and that is the practice of clitorectomy. Clitorectomy is a uh, 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 partial female uh, circumcision. At minimum, it requires the uh, the uh, the surgical removal of part of the female external genitalia. 
So you are not surprised uh, to, to hear that this family um, comes from a tradition that practices clitorectomy, but what you are shocked to hear is that this family intends to carry out this, uh, this ritual, this African ritual on their 12-year-old daughter. You protest that doing so will permanently inhibit this, 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 this girl from uh, enjoying the full pleasures of sex. The mother retorts, you just don't understand our culture. Um, you don't understand that this ritual is very important to us and it ensures the purity of our daughter for marriage by um, uh, dissuading her from engaging in premarital sex. She voluntarily admits that while the practice is not explicitly measure, uh, mentioned in the Quran, it is uh, typical, uh, it, it's been a uh, common practice in indigenous African tribes for centuries, perhaps millennia. After a very heated and uncomfortable discussion, you walk down the hall telling yourself that you are adamantly opposed to this from your own cultural tradition as an American, but that, uh, that you are sensitive to the fact that um, this, is their, th th this is their tradition and that if you lived in our Khartoum rather than Queens, perhaps it wouldn't even seem to be that serious of an issue. But then it also occurs to you that clitorectomy is illegal in the United States under the law. And that if you report uh, the, the intentions of the family to a social worker, you are likely to be able to save this girl from this uh, procedure which you consider tantamount to mutilation. Well, here we have a rather uh, pointed example between relativism and objectivism. On one hand, you want to be judgmental of the practice. You believe that the fundamental bodily integrity of this young girl might be compromised permanently. On the other hand, you, you have part, part of yourself that wants to be tolerant and understanding of this Muslim African tradition um, even though that's not your own tradition. Um, we have this tension between relativism and objectivism that runs throughout American culture. Is there a solution to this tension? Uh, for me, um, I found a way to resolve it by um, appealing to a universal doctrine of human rights. This holds that every human individual has the right to a bodily integrity and not to have their, their, uh, their bodily, their, their inte the integrity of their personhood violated both in terms of body and psychologically. And that things that mar people for life either uh, mentally or physically would be unethical. On this model that I've adopted uh, as a way to adjudicate the conflict between relativism and objectivism, it's okay for us to be tolerant of practices, uh, 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 birthing rituals and marriage rituals and funeral rituals, which, um, which do not violate fundamental human rights. And in terms of these sorts of practices that are rooted in culture, it's okay to be tolerant and accepting of them. However, when there are practices which cross the line and violate fundamental human rights, violate the bodily integrity of people, or cause psychological and emotional harm, then we have the right to be judgmental, and we have the right to practice 
ethical objectivism and to level our judgment against those practices and say those practices are unethical and are not to be tolerated. So here, um, by appealing to universal human rights, um, I think that we have a, a nice way of drawing a line between relativism on one hand and objectivism on the other hand and, and providing a criterion by which we, uh, we can decide whether to be tolerant of, uh, of, of cultural practices or intolerant and judgmental. Now, that uh, ethical relativism and objectivism is the premier meta-ethical question in philosophy. Let's move on and briefly consider normative ethics. Normative ethics, if we continue our analogy with religion, are the actual ethical theories themselves. In philosophy, we, uh, we draw a, uh, we, we, we divide normative ethics into two broad categories, rule ethics and virtue ethics. Virtue ethics, also known as character ethics, focuses on the personality, the disposition, the character of the morally good, that is, virtuous person. Virtue ethics tends to be rather flexible in its theoretical construction. It allows for role models the Buddha, or Christ, or Muhammad, or Martin Luther King, or my personal favorite, Socrates. Typically, on the virtue ethics approach, one asks the question, what would X do in this situation? What would my role model do in this situation? And then you try to pattern your actions, your life, um, after the role model, the role model that is held up to be an exemplar of virtue. Virtue ethics is the approach to normative ethics which is typical of ancient Greek and Roman and Christian and other uh, religious traditions um, and also uh, the German philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, who we will look at uh, in a few lectures from now. On the other hand, philosophers have taken a different approach to ethics, normative ethics, and this is the rule ethic approach. Instead of uh, asking the question, what would X do in this particular situa situation, Normative ethics is imperative in its character. It says, do X. It's much more rigid in this way than virtue ethics, and it is typical of modern philosophers such as John Stuart Mill and Immanuel Kant, who we will also consider in subsequent lectures. So, within normative ethics, we have virtue ethics, and rule ethics, and within the context of these lectures, um, Plato and Augustine and Nietzsche and the feminist uh, moral psychologist Carol Gilligan will be examples of virtue ethics, which we will look at um, in, in f future lectures. And then on the other hand, we have rule ethics, and we will be looking at uh, the utilitarianism of John Stuart Mill and the deontology of Immanuel Kant as example, examples of rural ethics. Now, as good philosophers, we want to know which approach to ethics, normative ethics, is primary. Is virtue ethics or rural ethics more foundational, more fundamental? Is it rules? Are rules really the, the essential way to approach the study of moral philosophy? 
The problem with saying that rules are the primary way of studying moral philosophy is that there is no reason to adhere to rules unless you have the character, the disposition, the personality to do so. In other words, there is no reason to stick to rules unless you're virtuous. Is virtue ethics, on the other hand, the primary, the essential, the foundational, the fundamental approach to ethics? The problem with, with asserting that virtue ethics is primary is that it's hard to know which virtues to cultivate in people, in children, for example, without having some guidelines, some principles, or rules to go by. My answer is that rule and virtue ethics seem to be complementary aspects of the philosophical study of morality. The human condition is so uh, diverse and has so many shades of gray that both rule ethics and virtue ethics tell us something about um, how we ought to best live our lives and, and, uh, and, and are useful uh, mechanisms by which to study moral philosophy. Their distinction is useful for academic purposes, in other words, but when it comes to daily concrete human life, both approaches seem to be important and relevant. Now, uh, let's uh, consider virtue ethics in a little greater detail. As I alluded to in the first lecture, all ethical theories presuppose some notion of moral goodness. In these lectures, we will look at three virtue ethics which presuppose rather radically different notions or concepts of ultimate moral goodness. Um, in the next lecture, we will look at the philosophy, the moral philosophy of the great Christian philosopher, Saint Augustine. And for Augustine, the highest moral good is obedience to God and virtuous character is the manifestation of such obedience. We will then turn to uh, another virtue ethicist, but essentially opposite from Augustine, Frederick Nietzsche. And for Nietzsche, the manifestation of virtuous or good character is not obedience to God or, or, or any supernatural being or even the, 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 the constrictions of society, but rather to exercise one's individualism, one's will to power, um, to, be, to become the person one has the potential of becoming. At the very end of these lectures, we will turn to the, uh, the moral philosophy of the psychologist Carol Gilligan, who argues that the exercising of care and empathy in affirming interpersonal relationships is a manifestation of virtuous character. In terms of rule ethics, we will look at um, two main varieties, consequentialism and non-consequentialism. Consequentialism is the rule ethics, the normative rule ethics that asserts that you should judge alternative actions by the results they produce. Different notions of moral good when interpreted in terms of consequentialism, uh, produce different theories. The most important consequentialistic theory in the Western intellectual tradition is that of the English philosophers Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. For them, for Bentham and Mill, the highest moral good is pleasure or happiness. 
but that is not individual happiness or pleasure per se, but collective societal happiness. We call this, this theory, uh, the normative ethics, uh, which takes a rule ethic approach that is consequentialistic and focuses on collective societal good as utilitarianism. On the other hand, the other kind of uh, uh, rule ethics that we will focus on is the non-consequentialism of German philosopher Immanuel Kant. For the non-consequentialist, it is not consequences that are the sole determining factor, although they're important to consider, it's just that they're not the sole determining factor of right and wrong action. There are other considerations. For Kant, this other consideration is acting in accordance to duty. I'd like to end this lecture by providing a, an example of consequentialism versus non-consequentialism in rural ethics. Let's say we're in a TV studio and let's say that we hear a loud rapping on the door with an irate agitated voice shouting, it's Dr. Keller in there. I'm a student of his from last semester and he gave me a D and I deserved a C. I'm going to kill him. Jack, the cameraman, is in somewhat of a moral quandary. We, we might even say an ethical dilemma. If Jack is a consequentialist in the uh, spirit of John Stuart Mill, he will analyze this, the situation here in the TV studio in terms of the consequences of alternative actions. Uh, telling the truth and opening the door and saying, oh yeah, Keller's right over there cowering in the corner, or lying and not opening the door and saying, we're in the middle of taping uh, Utah Business Boardroom and uh, Keller, Keller's not around here and, 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 and lying essentially. Now, so the consequentialist would evaluate alternative actions based on the consequences those actions were uh, liable to produce. And if Jack, hypothetically, were to conclude that there would be more societal damage done by telling the truth, opening the door, allowing the irate student from last semester to storm in here and murder me, uh, thus ending my life, uh, presumably upsetting my family, friends, wife, and so on, uh, and... Uh, causing him to be thrown in jail, uh, perhaps for the rest of his life, um, versus simply lying and having him storm off, cool down, and no harm done. That's how a consequentialist would, would confront or analyze that situation. On the other hand, uh, let's say that Jack is a Kantian non-consequentialist, and Jack decides that it's his duty to tell the truth independently of the situation at hand, independently of the consequences produced. And by way of a complex sequence of reasoning, Jack, the cameraman, decides that it's his duty to tell the truth and to tell the irate student, yeah, Keller is in here, he's taping uh, a series of lectures on ethics, uh, and, and uh, laying the groundwork for the student to break the door down and come in here and harm me. In that situation, the consequentialist, the non-consequentialist, excuse me, would say, um, I did the right thing, I told the truth, I uh, lived up to my duty, the moral burden falls on the perpetrator of the violence, not me. And so we can see in everyday life, there are, many, uh, there, there are many examples of how we can analyze moral situations that we're in in terms of consequentialism or non-consequentialism. In the next lecture, we will be turning to uh, uh, investigation of the normative ethics of St. Augustine 
the virtue ethicist. Thanks.